in the funnel who they've got three browsers open, they're looking at your competitors. And if you're making it difficult, if you are that one with the slow loading page or extra clicks, then you lose that attention. And that's when you could lose the interest in someone who would go to purchase. Kind of crazy to say this in 2024, but I still see a lot of usability issues on mobile. When you're chatting to stakeholders, link your conversation to the overall business benefits. People still are not sure like, what what is CRO exactly. Uh, and when you show them the frameworks, their eyes kind of light up and they can see the dots starting to connect. Amazon's like its own internet, but your brand is completely different. And so there's no guarantee that copying them, which I think a lot of people think about doing, is going to have similar results. Our Aussie culture is pretty laid back. And so I think certainly some of our brands um, leverage that quite well. It resonates really well with, with um, consumers. Yes, there's CRO and AB testing, but yeah. what we're also doing is experimenting and coming up with ideas and insights. Yes, we're aiming to improve the conversion rate on a website. There's a commercial outcome to this, but by the way, is all these other things that we're bringing into the business that's going to help everyone grow with this mindset and approach. Right. Bigger businesses, CRO is so powerful, but it can't do anything if you don't have support from leaders. And also Correct. CRO is a bit more of a mid long term game. We've got to have a roadmap. We need to test to learn. We might have some losers to get to winners. Many business owners, they've got pretty big targets and they often will look at things that might happen a, a bit faster. Welcome to another episode of the CRO Wizard series by VWO Podcast. In this series, we speak to top CRO leaders in e-commerce, media, subscription, retail, banking, and other industries about CRO strategies and the positive impact they can have on your business. Before we speak to our special guest for this episode, here's a quick summary of who we are and what we do. VWO is a leading experience optimization platform. Using our latest product, VWO Insights, you can analyze user journeys and identify conversion roadblocks on your website and mobile app. So without any further delay, let's jump right into the conversation. Our guest today is a true expert in e-commerce growth and optimization. Please welcome Ilan Hurwitz, the founder and CRO specialist at Clever Conversions, an e-commerce consultancy that's been making waves since Jan 2023. Elan has been an invaluable e-commerce growth advisor for Australian D2C brands, blending strategy with execution to drive remarkable results for nearly three years. His skills in marketing strategy, revenue, profit growth, and e-commerce optimization have set him apart in the field. He's also recently co-founded Pure Leap Wellness, a venture that's set to launch soon marking another exciting chapter in his entrepreneurial journey. Before getting into his current role, Elan spent over a decade at Optus, Australia's telecommunications giant. There he had various senior positions, including digital product owner for the Optus mobile app and senior e-commerce manager for the prepaid division. His leadership and strategic vision led to three consecutive years of growth and earned him the prestigious number one club award, placing him in the top 1% of sales performance uh, company-wide. Elan's career is a testament to his availability to drive significant growth, optimize customer experiences, and lead cross-functional teams to success. We are thrilled to have him on the podcast to share the insights. Hi, Elan. Welcome to Sierra Wizard series by BW Podcast. How is it going today? Very well, Sid. It's really good to be with you, and thanks for the, thanks for the great intro. No, it. I mean, I've gone through your profile and you have been doing a tremendous job. And uh, I mean, kudos to all the great work that you have been doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's been quite a journey. Perfect. So uh, we are thrilled to have you. And, uh, you know, I was looking forward to hosting you for quite some time. So, you know, before we get started, I just wanted to understand what do you love most about your working in the CRO industry? I think for me, I often say to people, CRO, it's a bit like, it's, bit, it's quite similar to marketing, and that's my background. That's where um, I started um, in more traditional marketing, go to market before right. I started getting into digital roles. And during those digital roles, I started doing CRO and working on optimization. I find it quite similar in a way, uh, in yeah. that you're, the principles are the same. You're really trying to understand your customer. Uh, understand how your product helps them and then figure out a way to communicate that in a better way. And that's what we do really with, with CRO. There's a lot more to CRO. I think around there's technical aspects, there's 
Um, there's UX, there's consumer psychology. So I think that's quite exciting as well because it's almost like a bit like an art and a science. You know, there's a lot of science to it with data. And that's where I think CRO is a little bit different is that you do have access to a lot more data because you're seeing what's happening on the website. But there's also that art to it and that marketing perspective where you still need to come up with creative solutions around copy or ux or design and actually make it make it valuable to customers and then the best thing is you actually you can test it and you can see really? if those things, things are working which i think i think uh that's always good when you can measure something you can be able to say yes that idea you kind of spend all this time researching and that idea that you had you bring it to life and actually and actually see the growth happen very true very true uh, exactly as you mentioned there are multiple uh, elements in this like ui ux psychology marketing everything it's a mix of a lot of things that goes into the picture to help you improve your user experience and uh, i believe this should be a course in business administration programs as well at least an optional course so that users can at least understand because i think cro is still a niche industry not a lot of people really know about it uh, so uh, i think introducing this as a course would be a great uh, you know uh, work in the field of education so that a lot of people are aware of what cro exactly is yeah i i agree completely i think people do bits of cro quite well people there's obviously good people with design and ux and there's analytics and right. but people still are not sure like what what is cro exactly uh, and when you show them the frameworks their eyes kind of light up and they can see the dots starting to connect exactly. i think a lot of it has to do with the challenges around ab testing and we might get into this later like it can be difficult um with resources or having certain amounts of traffic so people think cro and they think ab testing which is of course the core of it but right. um you can also start how do you get to your first test or or how do you start just to understand the research part of cro and there's still so much value in that in terms of experimentation and understanding your customer which i, I agree with you completely should be a part of any good um, mba or digital digital marketing course let, let's hope let's hope the, the course is introduced and a lot of more people get to know about CRO. Elan, what inspired your career in uh, A-B testing and conversion rate optimization and how has your journey been so far? I think it um, really started from working in marketing and, and right. that was, I spent most of my time, as you mentioned, at, at Optus, which is a large telecommunications company here. And um, my the first half of, I was there for 12 years, the first half was very much traditional marketing roles. So as a go-to-market manager, working with some of the large handset manufacturers like Samsung, like Apple, to launch devices into the market. Right. With marketing joint marketing campaigns. And then I was a product marketing manager, which mm -hmm. was more around owning the P&L and some commercial acumen. And then the second half was more digital. So that's when I got into um, become an e-commerce manager. And I also was a product owner for the app. So a real mix of different business and, and marketing marketing roles um, but I love e-commerce so I do, do specialize um, in e-commerce CRO and I say to people as well some growth marketing as well it's kind of the two right. the two disciplines overlap uh, quite a bit and I ran a couple of e-commerce side hustles which I always enjoyed selling Kindles on eBay selling had my own online soccer shops so I really love that entrepreneurial mindset and I just think um, e-commerce is great in the way people can actually start quite small and grow into incredible businesses, um, something they're passionate about. And so I, um, I always wanted to have my own business. And so a few years ago, I, yeah. uh, I left to, to just consult for a lot of e-commerce businesses. It was during COVID. So a lot of businesses, they had to shut their retail stores. Everyone right. was shopping online and they were just looking for, they wanted to move quickly and they were just looking for good advice to help them do that. So I started out doing that, but uh, and during that time, uh, I would ob obviously go to their website through for them and they just, people just weren't talking about some basic analytics or understanding right. some of the consumer psychology. And so that's where the idea for Clever Conversions came about where I've kind of brought all that experience together, trying to really help people understand um, what CRO is and how they can um, go through the whole the whole process and and um, and and to grow their business with CRO. No, so so basically, it was your experience in the product digital and the marketing side that ultimately led you to do, doing CRO as well. And as you rightly said, uh, uh, post COVID. Uh, things really changed. In fact, COVID has, uh, you know, fast forwarded the technology 
for the next 10 years uh, in that case things were moving so slow but then a lot of brands did realize the importance of CRO and they started doing it i think exactly uh, right and i think the other thing yeah my journey's been a little different it was started more marketing and business and then moved into CRO. I think a lot of people go into CRO or they start in analytics or UX. But right. that, that, I find that experience has helped me because I think CRO, to be successful, ultimately you need to understand the customer and what's important to the business to come up with the right ideas and tests. But, yeah, to your point, I think CRO has become important with COVID, but it's become even more important in the last year or so just to right. The, um, in a lot of countries, the cost of living and the economy. During COVID, people were spending lots of money and uh, they were sitting at home shopping online. So conversion rates were pretty high and people could spend money on Facebook and it worked really well. That's not really happening anymore. So now you need to make every single session count. And so people are showing a lot more interest in, interest in understanding what is actually happening on my website? Where are people dropping off and how can I improve this number? Because if I can improve that number, the whole business rises. So, and uh, Elan talking about, uh, you know, conducting a UX, uh, you're on a CRO audit, what commonly uh, usability issues do you typically encounter? It's kind of crazy to say this in 2024, but right. I still see a lot of usability issues on mobile. I, I, I most D2C consumer brands, 70, 80% of users are on mobile. So we need to try and put ourselves in the place of our customers, but often uh, within a few minutes of reviewing a site, and I'm talking about some big brands here, I'm not talking about people who are just starting out. I go on mobile and I'm seeing lots of pop-ups or I'm seeing responsiveness is, the headline is going across too many lines, just lots of little usability issues. It kind right. of makes sense. We spend all day on our desktop. <laughs> Um, Correct. Everyone is, and we check the site on our desktop and it's kind of easy to forget. So that that's that's a big one which we still see and it's easy to solve. Obviously in Chrome, you can quickly look at mobile view, but there's a couple of good apps that always rec that make it much easier to check as well. So um, that's one. Uh, the other the other common one I see is just the hierarchy um, in menus. Um, okay. and and um and also use of search or um, leveraging search. With uh, When you look at heat maps, <clears throat> almost always you see one in four people have dropped off below the fold, sometimes even higher. Now, yep. that initially people think that's not good, but well, it might not be a bad thing because people might are engaging with your menu and your search, which is a good thing because they're in e-commerce, they're looking through products, and the closer they get to a collections page or products, they're showing more intent. But what I often see is, again, the menu has been somewhat um, designed for desktop. And so that long list, people put these huge lists there. So, and, and you give, as we know, we give customers too much choice and they, what they, make, uh, and they make the easiest decision, which is no choice at all because they're just looking at this long list and they just can't find something and they're overwhelmed with the options. So it's just so important to get that hierarchy right. It can be a painful exercise going through how many people are clicking, how many people are, what's the organic. I was in a meeting yesterday and we were looking at how many people were clicking to certain links, but we wanted to understand organic search because that's the sales opportunity, what's the demand. So it's a, always a bit of a debate, but it's worth the effort to, to get that to get that right. So see that um, so often, again, in the menu, a common issue is just too many clicks for people to get to a product or a collection. They've got to, they've got to click a parent category, then a subcategory, then maybe another subcategory. And it's like three clicks to get to a page. It's, it's too much. So that's one um, on menu. And then, of course, with search, um, normally you can use some software or an app um, to support your search. It's getting pretty good now with AI, but Sometimes even if a product's not available and I see no results on the search page, it's like you need right. to show people something. That That's a, quite a simple example. But the, the core principle is like your search really needs to be providing really, really re relevant results. Totally agreed with your point. Uh, considering uh, you said that, especially in the e-commerce brands, 80% uh, of the traffic is on mobile. So that's that's where the priority has to be. 
and even in my experience what i've seen is that users who tend to use the uh, search on the website tend mm -hmm. to convert at least four to five times higher yes. than users who don't right that's exactly right yep yes so having an optimized search is really important and especially i really like the other point that you said uh, about the clicks because as business owners we might feel that it's just a matter of a couple of clicks not yeah. a big deal but for a user that's a friction point right? such a good point and again we're just so close to our business and it just seems so straightforward it's just a couple of clicks but we need to keep in mind our customer and remember that attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter firstly on mobile right. how do people use their mobile they probably just go sit on a bus and look at the people using right. their mobile look at they're looking at it and then they're looking away they could be distracted at any moment people True. are coming from People are coming from apps like TikTok. What's TikTok? It's 10 second videos, 15 seconds. I mean, the attention economy is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And if someone wants your product, they'll get it, they'll get through. If if you've decided that you want a product, you will click through. But but remember your con that's that's three percent, five percent. What's your conversion rate? That's a small portion portion. We need to keep in mind those people who are higher up in the funnel who They've got three browsers open. They're looking at your competitors. And if you're making it difficult, if you are that one with a slow loading page or extra clicks, then you lose that attention. And that's when you could lose the interest in someone who would go to purchase. Another one probably just to throw in there is um, that I see a lot is the, the journey consistency from ad to landing page or just from home page. So, sure. so often people click on an ad and... We, they just get thrown to this collections page and it's got no link in messaging to the ad I'd and so that's so. where people are going to drop off that that's always a really big one and it happens throughout site um as well so that's always a a quick win that that you can find when you do when you do an audit and i'd say to people just this is this is something you can check yourself uh particularly with engagement and and time on site like if you want to see what the attention span is you can go into your ga4 and have a look at how many how much time people are actually spending on your site and you'll realize like yeah every second really does count it's all about that attention span which we need to capture and make sure we are delivering the right content and results in that specific duration that we have so every second of a user matters on the website and to you know have have a better understanding of all this the importance uh, there's you know th there's a lot of importance that is being given to the research especially in when it comes to CRO. so how do you balance between the qualitative and the uh, quantitative research are there any docs uh, or, or are there any especially do's or don'ts that you follow in this case we have a checklist that that we go through okay. when we're kicking off research okay it is a, it's a bit of a dance isn't it between quant and qual the two i think i see on sometimes linkedin people talking about data versus customer and quant versus qual and yes. and it's it's not binary they completely work together when you start a CRO audit you want to try and uncover some issues okay so how are we going to do that well we can go through the site and we're going to see some issues okay. but how big are those issues yeah. we don't know we're one person going through the site so we need to go into we need to go into analytics or a heat map tool to actually understand is this an issue for a lot of people or was it just something we um we observed on on maybe it's not an important product or page as an example so that that's one way and then you do vice versa not all issues are obvious um, by going through the site and so we look in ga4 or uh, or heat maps or whatever it might be to understand okay this doesn't look right this page has very very low engagement or there's a high bounce rate yeah whatever it might be like why is this happening okay let's go look at the experience on this page or let's look at what happens from facebook to the website like why is this why is this number so low so that that's where the two i find myself when we start audits just you're constantly switching back and forth as you're going down the rabbit hole and trying to just come up with um, the high priority list of items. Then, of course, just understanding from a qual perspective the voice of of the customer. At the end of the right. day, there's a person on the other end of the computer. There's a person who's going to be buying and purchasing 
your product and the quant data just can't tell you why people do certain things. And also with cold data, you get new ideas. Like I can go through the site, um, you know, you, and we can all give our opinions, but we're not actually the customer. We're often the worst people to give opinions because we're so close to so many different parts of the business, the product, the resources, right. those sorts of things. And so the qual gives you uh, those, just those really true customer insights. But I've just, all my experience doing qual research, like you get new ideas. It's not just about how do we fix this? They'll, they'll because it's just people thinking out loud, um, it then becomes, okay, oh, have you thought about this? And it's something you never thought about and then you have a new idea on your hand. And then, of course, you need to kind of put some quant into the qual. What I mean by that is, is, was it just one person that said that? Or like, oh, there's a pattern here. And that's probably my next big point around the importance of quant is that it's great to uncover insights, but then you need to prioritize them and you need to figure out what to test. And so you need, you need that quant to help understand the size of an issue and how important it is um, right. before you decide that you're going to, because you ne next have to figure out, okay, I'm going to invest dev resources or design resources, and that's equally important part of the whole process. And so that's where the yeah, quant is really important. Totally agreed. It has to be a mix of both, uh, you know, quant and qual, and uh, especially uh, whenever we are viewing the site, it has to be more from a user's perspective. Yeah as to how a user would navigate, what are the friction areas that they might face. And I believe that definitely helps us get come up with a few ideas that sometimes works wonders as well in terms of improving the engagement or experience that way. So since you have been working uh, you know, for so long and have been helping brands, so any tests that you have run that led to interesting learning or great uplifts? Yeah, I might give you uh, two examples. One at um, an enterprise when I worked at Optus and one at one at a one of my D2C clients. Uh, so um, at Optus, when you or any telecommunications company around the world, you go buy a SIM and then you have to go online and activate it. And the first step is to put in your SIM number, which okay. most people which most people do on their phone. Right. And it was such a simple idea. We just changed, it was a, and I still see this on mobiles, it was a full alphabet QWERTY okay. keyboard on okay. iPhone and we just changed it to a number pad only and saw from memory, it was a, it was a while ago, but it was, I think it was about a 10% uplift in conversion rate for okay. first time users. Most people, because they bought the SIM, were going to, but it's so frustrating to keep coming back and back because it's. I think it was a 13 digit number and so okay. you get one number wrong and then it doesn't let you go then you don't know what number's wrong well, and by having the number pad yeah uh, you increase the chance of them just making it easy so it's such a it, it, it was such a simple change such a simple change so i like that one because it just shows particularly as you get to enterprise and and really when there's big big numbers at play like the small changes can really have a, a big impact and that of course had an impact for the business because uh, it, it, it was great for the customer most importantly but for the business people activating earlier on means they start using the service and, and sure. all the business benefits come from that as well from a d2c perspective one example um which i really like was a product page redesign okay and it was good because the client wanted to go through the few for the full process so we did <clears throat> um I, I did the research and strategy for the page and then work with a really good developer and designer it was a really solid team where everyone really was able to understand what we were trying to do so this is on the other end of the spectrum and what you might call a big swing test so it was a complete overhaul of the landing page he didn't have mountains of traffic to test different elements and uh, it worked it worked really well we saw a 46 percent increase in conversion wow. rate hmm. and 54 percent increase in revenue possession i'll be honest that's quite yes. rare yeah, exactly. Very good. Like that, it's very yeah. rare, but but we really spent a lot of time. Um, that and and yeah, it just kind of shows what happens when you do that research and strategy piece well up up front. Um, then then the quality kind of flows from there with with um with your devs and your designers and the rest of the team. I especially like uh, how you spoke about uh, one simple idea and one change wherein the entire layout was changed because. I believe CRO is a mix of both changing, you know, simple, making simple mm. changes and making complex changes as well. You just can't 
follow one single approach and go okay that all the changes that i'll do would be major changes on the website it does not necessarily guarantee you success even though sometimes a very small change maybe a copy change a color change a positioning of the cta mm. make a lot of difference that way and uh, in fact even i have seen cases where in a simple change has resulted in uh, you know really great uplift in terms of uh, engagement and conversions i think it's why i like sero as well um you have to be humble i think in that sure. nothing you get surprised all the time correct you know, so you learn not to really um make those those big assumptions like things that have worked before and and i think as well thinking about like what's right for one business isn't right for another like a lot of businesses um hear about doing like that number pad test and 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 oh, i'm going to do that and it's like it might not work for your business you might not have enough traffic like this is the sort of test that you that you need to look at but yeah it's never ceases to surprise me some of the the types of uplifts that that you can see with the smaller tests and since we have been speaking about uh, you know uh, the kind of results that you have got so uh, are there any key metrics uh, that you focus on when analyzing of success of uh, cro programs for for your clients it really varies from um client to client yeah. there's always the general metrics and hmm. the key kpis around conversion rate aov and and revenue per session right. depending on the type of business or perhaps their traffic levels you've got your secondary kpis which happen before a purchase like add to cart or newsletter sign up or cross sell um addition of, of cross sell for example in the flow the other important thing and this can tend to happen at bigger businesses is not to to ensure your KPIs are not siloed hmm. so how do you make sure that you are setting a KPI for the website and you want to see an improvement that actually is linked to overall business strategy and financial goals it doesn't always have to be financial the goals hmm. could be um, customer NPS for example or they right. might be um take up of a certain product but at bigger companies there's a strategy document somewhere in your business or in your business unit that's been set at the beginning of the year and all your leaders and the business is moving in the direction of achieving those goals right and and so how do you just make sure that you um you set it up right from the beginning and so um your your work is contributing to those goals which is also important for bigger organizations because uh when you demonstrate that then you get better buy in and resources and that probably comes to my second part of my answer uh if you're a smaller business you're nimble you can kind of just get things done at, at bigger businesses cro is so powerful but it can't do anything if you don't have support from leaders if you don't have the resources if you don't have the buy in and it's a particular challenge for cro because there's probably a bit of a lack of awareness about what it can do and also Correct. cro is a bit more of a mid long term game it's it's we've got we've got to have a road map we need to test to learn we might have some losers to get to winners and that's not many business owners particularly if they um or executives they've got pretty big targets and they uh often will look at things that might happen a, a bit faster and so if you're just presenting that your KPIs are their KPIs uh but the other KPIs I think as well is um executives have all this they're investing in different things to grow the business and they want to know that this program's going well so I think you've got to look at program KPIs um as well and that's things like test velocity and just business engagement and just that ability to briefly summarize to an executive how what you're doing is um worthy of investment and contributing to customer satisfaction and the bottom line so showing that i think is um yeah really important part of of um getting a strong program going i really love the point when you mentioned you need to get to a lot of losers to you know reach a winner right again it yeah. is definitely a long term game it's not a t20 cricket it's mm -hmm. test cricket you uh, website can never be perfect you will have to keep optimizing consistently to make sure you just keep enhancing the experience of the users and it has to be a mix of winners and losers but it's not about the winners and losers it's about the learning that you get from the and implement yeah. the next test yeah. it's such a challenge it's such a challenge because like no one wants even that term like no one wants to hear the word lose right yes, but right. yes. I, you and i know and people that have been through it so you've just yeah how do you are 
articulate like and set expectations like this is what's going to happen right. um and by the way the biggest companies in the world do this and like we're going to make sure that like if we don't this is what we're building we got to show you like this is this is the this is the strategy this is the end state and you should expect that we're not going to get winners straight away right. um, um stay the course yeah which is a tricky can be a tricky conversation to have it's, it's i guess it's more about uh, understanding what cro is i, I believe yeah. when yes. people have that understanding uh, they'll accept it's more about adoption i still believe it's mm. not in the early stages. yeah i think you're right and i think you know a lot of people talking about experimentation now and i and i like that and i think that that helps because it it starts to show the business that yes there's cro and ab testing but mm. what we're also doing is um, experimenting and coming up with ideas and insights that, uh, yes, we're able to improve the conversion rate on a website. There's a commercial outcome to this, but by the way, here's all these other things that we're bringing into the business that's going to help help everyone grow with this mindset and approach. Right. I think that's, yeah, I've noticed that coming up in the last few years right. and a lot of CRO agencies and a lot of CRO leaders talking about experimentation and it, like, it ma makes a lot of sense. E-commerce websites often require server-side testing for implementing, you know, advanced changes. So do brands face challenges when undertaking such optimization, especially server-side level changes? Yeah, it's just, um, it's just a lot more complex and risky, isn't it? Doing, doing the server side. I think, um, like the analogy of a car is quite good. <laughs> like if you're doing client side testing, like changing, changing the paint job or moving, you know, moving things around, um, a little bit, um, is okay. And you, maybe you can move it back. And if it doesn't work, like the engine's still okay. But, uh, with server side, you're really starting to <clears throat> tinker with the engine and make some big changes. So right. it gets complex. Uh, and when things get complex, particularly depending on the size of the business, um, right. you're tinkering with, uh, with the certain things yeah the, the risk starts to come in then you need more resources to manage that risk and all of this could be um could be impacting your your customers as well so you've just got to be um yeah just got to be a lot more cautious and careful makes sense especially the resources part uh, is what i believe is again really important when it comes to server side because this is more of a developer heavy approach mm. wherein you need your developers to sit with you and you know make sure it, they are doing the right set of changes in terms of, you know, whatever experience that you want to create, unlike the client side experience. So yeah. I believe that uh, resources is the backbone, especially when you have to do server side. Exactly. I mean, it has the benefits, of course, um, where you can really uncover like significant, significant core business opportunities. And for certain businesses, they need, they really need to, to do that um, because they're almost their interface is linked to their product itself. Right. So they, they need to look into that. But yeah, as you say, like you need to go in, um, you need to go in with the right resources to be able to manage it and QA and yeah, everything that you need to be able to manage it properly. Very true. Very true. Ilan, you have been working with so many uh, e-commerce brands. So according to you, what is the CRO maturity level of e-commerce brands in Australia? Really good question. I think it, it kind of... Um, looking at mid market and then probably enterprise is where in mid market there are, i think there are a lot of businesses that can do cro mm. what i mean by that is they could afford the resources mm. uh, and they have the traffic to right. to do tests mm -hmm. but they're not they're not there i think there's still um big opportunity just if you look at our peers in the the us um or europe there there is still um those same types of businesses are quite mature with CRO, right. and i think it's just more around education and, and awareness of what's what's possible um, right. i think early stage businesses they don't quite have the traffic but there's still an opportunity there for them to learn some of the principles right. of CRO and and uh just some of the things around analytics and heat maps. But on that, I'd say that's probably a broader challenge with GA4 and things like that. Mm. On the enterprise level, the Australian market is really mature. Uh, if you were to go to like, some of the biggest insurance companies, telcos, okay. banks, you'll see really, really mature um, CRO programs, properly resourced, still challenges, I'm, I'm sure. 
in, in getting leadership buy-in, but those businesses are, are um, operating what I would say best-in-class experimentation programs. Uh, and I agree to your point because I've had experience working uh, in both the US market and I currently I look after APAC, ANZ. So I believe uh, we are still in the nascent stages. Uh, Have you terms. observed that? Yep. Yeah. Yes, right. So I believe there's a long way to go. And though people are uh, in APAC, ANZ, they, they do want results, uh, but but the adoption of CRO is still in the nascent stages. So I, I, I believe if we are able to uh, you know increase this knowledge sharing in terms of CRO spe specifically in ANZ and APAC, uh, brands would be able to do much more better. Yeah, you think that's what the main thing is, the knowledge and awareness just... Since we have been talking about uh, you know the Australian market, is there any uniqueness you find in the customer behavior? And uh, how do you think e-commerce brand should address these unique behaviors? A lot of people tell you we're similar to the US and the UK in a lot of ways, but there's certainly a few key differences I would highlight. One is definitely a preference for local and okay. sustainability is hmm. um, becoming a really strong trend in Australia. People are being uh, really conscious right. of what they say, or or they say they're really conscious. And this, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is controversial or not. But people will talk a lot about buying local and sustainability. But then at the same time, a lot of people, their the, uh, number of purchases from Shane and Timu have increased from Australia, who yep. aren't um, aren't local and um, perhaps um, don't have such a strong sustainability. Angles. But people do talk about that being important. Probably more relevant, I'd say, in Australia is quite um, yeah. strong adopters of technology. Okay. I remember even uh, working at Optus, a lot of the handset manufacturers would, if they wanted to launch a new device, they would start with Australia because okay. there's relatively good income and Ooh. strong adoption. It's a, great, it's a good way to test before you might um, you'd go roll out to Europe and the US because we were early doctors. And if you look historically, things like the iPhone, Australia's okay. always had a very, very Ooh. strong, very, very strong take up. And so that obviously would come through in mobile usage. Ooh. One that's um, particularly interesting for Australia, which is different um, to similar markets, is the Amazon adoption of Amazon. So latest figures have Amazon at about 10% in Australia. So okay. that's quite different. Um, and it's changing very, very quickly. So Amazon just overtook eBay uh, in the okay. last six months, I think. Don't quote yeah. me on that. But yeah. um, to become the most popular marketplace. But in America, it's 50%. So exactly. the consumer yeah. behavior in America is very different because you might go to a website and probably what's the next thing you're going to do is like, can I get it from Amazon? So... We're um, not there yet, but some part, some people certainly thinking that way. Um, and I think it's coming. I think it's coming, and that's going to present some pretty interesting questions for Australian retailers because it's going to change the expectations about, for example, what does delivery look like? Like Amazon changes what we expect around delivery. We expect it the next day. So now retailers are going to have to ask themselves um, about about their delivery just as one example um so i think that's going to be quite interesting so they're the i would say the the main i mean one thing with, there is aussie culture is pretty laid back um and so i think certainly some of our brands um leverage that quite well and, yeah. and you, you can get away with a little bit of a, a cheeky brand and a bit of a sense of humor and, and actually that resonates um resonates really well with with um consumers since you were speaking about Amazon, I remember there there have been cases wherein I'm at least clients who have just entered into CRO and their, their statement used to be, we just want to be like Amazon. And yes. everything that they want to follow is from Amazon, like yeah. the, search, the results, everything. So, uh, so yeah, I believe Amazon had set that strong benchmark, but every brand has their own uniqueness in terms of the value propositions they offer. And I think, like, internally, if... Um... If you look at some of the most popular quotes from Jeff Bezos, he talks mm. about testing and they really had that mindset from the beginning. Right. Externally, people say, I want to be like Amazon. Uh, but, I mean, if you were a designer, you would probably look at Amazon and go, what is going on here? But I think that's where as well with CRO, like you've really got to understand the value proposition 
Like mm. Amazon can get away with a lot of a lot of things, um, a lot of different patterns and UX conventions and designs on their website because it's the lowest price and free delivery. And Correct. it's Amazon. They have the brand. They Correct. have the brand. And so um, that um that means that uh people are just will persevere but also they've they've trained people with a certain pattern so for amazon amazon's like its own internet so for people Correct. on amazon they know where their one buy one click buy button is and so they're not going to change that so that works for them but your brand is completely different and so um there's no guarantee that you know, copying them which i think a lot of people think about doing is going to have similar results and uh, for brands that uh, want to unlock CRO for growth, uh, what word of advice do you want to share? Be curious. Um, mm. If you haven't yet, just get started. Just get started. Okay. If you're a smallish team, a pretty yeah. agile team, you could start testing with mm. VWO a test mm -hmm. today. In the next 24 hours, you can sign up to, there's a free plan, so there's no excuse because that, despite the costs, which the costs for A-B testing gets returns. <laughs> that, that, they will get returns, but I think there's always that mindset of people who haven't started testing yet. Uh, you know, another cost, another cost. Um, but there's no reason why you can't spin up a test and get started very, very quickly. Um, and there's a whole lot of other analytics tools out there that are free that can help you um, to come up with your first test that that you can do so that's one way to get started and for bigger businesses okay there might be some more sign-offs to start yeah. testing you can't just go play with the website yeah. but again so i think the key there is get to know your stakeholders hmm. and um trying to understand and and just be, be that person who don't be afraid to put your hand up and say i want to lead the cro program like cool. absolutely works for businesses and if you can see opportunity, like get out there, speak to stakeholders and figure out what's needed to to get that first test or to show that it works. Because I think once you can show a test is working and show the results, like that's when it can really um really start to build. I believe this piece of advice should be helping a lot of our listeners, at least in terms of getting started. I believe that's that's the first step that we need to take. And then everything after that is all about learning and experimenting things that can definitely do wonders for your website right? and the final advice i would say is and it's coming back to an early one is when you're chatting to stakeholders hmm. link your conversation to the overall business benefits just cool. always remember to say what i want to do here it's going to help achieve this revenue make this amount of customers happy Correct. reduce the amount of ad spend by x and show them the numbers like show them like if we can get conversion rate from two to 2.1 2.2 whatever it is True. and you spend the same amount on ads like this is how much extra not just revenue we make but profit you make and you show that um you show that to people and that's when their eyes really start to to light up numbers work wonders especially when you give numbers work wonders nice yeah. i like that one i'm going to use that yeah so especially when you give projections i believe that gets you mm. the approval pretty quick in terms yeah. of what what can what are the results that we can expect from a program like this absolutely absolutely great uh, on a lighter note uh, ilan what's your favorite way to unwind after a long day that's a good question that's a good question i'd say watching some football okay watching some football yeah, yeah, big uh, Tottenham Hotspurs fan. Okay. And so at the moment, the European Championship's on. Yes. And so, yeah, it's a busy day. And then I've got a couple of kids, so that keeps me busy in the evening. And then at the end, when everyone's asleep, can mm. put on a, put on a so bit of football. Which team are you following? In the Euros, it's, um, I hate to say this as an Australian, but I'll, I do like to follow England, which okay. we don't normally, as you, um, I'm sure you know, with cricket and the Ashes. Um, mm. Yeah, Australia and New Zealand, Australia, yes. Australia and England's a rivalry, but because I, I, I follow the Premier League, um, yes, yeah, I do follow England. And then um, I'd say the team I also go for is um, I've got a, a few good friends from Holland, so I like to follow Holland closely as well. I've been a diehard Cristiano Ronaldo fan. Okay, so, nice. so, so it has been Portugal. We have won Euros already, won, so let's hope for the best this time. What happens? Yeah.
<laughs> it's um some people just follow like it's like basketball with lebron james it's like yes. it doesn't matter what the team is it's like messi or ronaldo um, it's kind of incredible how old is he now like 40 almost yes 40 40 he's still yeah i believe it's going to be his last euro for sure yeah i think so yes so so, I think so. I think so, so. hopefully he lifts the cup and best wishes for him <laughs> yeah yeah it's um yeah it's going to be a great tournament great tournament uh elan so we'll just move to the last part of this podcast wherein uh, i have a rapid fire round for you so okay. i have a set of questions and uh, uh, let's see what your instincts have to say yeah okay uh, uh, if you're starting a career in cro today what is the one thing that you would do differently i think is it something around google analytics if i was starting something differently i think i think probably what i would say is um to niche earlier to okay. find to find the um, type of businesses you want to work for earlier because CRO for a service business is different for CRO for an e-commerce business. Even in e-commerce, CRO for a fashion brand can be different for a for a, um, for a home goods brand. And the more you can understand product and customer, the more it helps you um, create great experiences. A newsletter that every CRO professional must follow? Bit of a curveball. I'm actually going to say Nick Sharma's D2C newsletter. Okay. Um, he touches on a lot of things around conversion rate uh, and landing page, um, which I find quite, yeah, really, uh, really valuable. Three books that you would recommend to our listeners? I'm currently reading, reading Don't Make Me Think. Okay. Um, so that's a, a huge one. I'm just trying to think what it was called, but um, Making Websites Win is, okay. is another one which I read uh, hmm. early on. You can't go past thinking fast and slow. Okay, great. I hope our listeners are making a note of this, and uh, hopefully these uh, books can add some value to their CRO journey as well. What's your go-to travel destination in Australia? I would say in Queensland, probably around Surface Paradise or Broad Beach. Great. One thing that AI will replace in the next three years? I think it's going to, ooh, three years or maybe not in three years, maybe mm. in three years is like probably search and probably a lot of websites. Mm. I think we're going to be all just interacting with our own uh, our own personal chatbots. If not a CRO specialist, what other profession would you have chosen? I would probably, probably be a soccer player. Um, I, okay. I would say that would have probably been an early one once, once, upon, once, uh, once upon a time. Yeah. Okay. One CRO metric that you wish people would stop obsessing over? Conversion rate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So much more to it. Yeah. Yeah. That conversion rate. And uh, the last question a dream or a goal that you want to achieve in the next three years? I'm just starting to really build out further conversions hmm. um, in the last year. And so that's my focus. After independent consulting, I'd love in a, in a few years to. Um, have have not not a big team, uh, maybe maybe f um, five to to ten people, and just a great roster of clients, just doing really um, good and interesting work. So I I since you're all uh, you know already being uh, you know doing some fantastic job, I wish uh, clever conversions you know uh, achieve a lot of success and uh, you know start helping a lot of brands across not just in APAC Australia, in fact globally as well. So. Wishing you all the luck with uh, clever conversions. Yeah. Thank you, Sid. Thank you for thank you very much for having me today. I really enjoyed the chat. Yes, it has been a pleasure. You know, meeting you, uh, especially your uh, answers and your insights have been really helpful, not just to me but also to all our listeners who are uh, who are currently in the CRO industry or aspire to get started with CRO. I believe this is really going to help them. So I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope to have you back on the podcast pretty soon again. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd really like that. Thanks, Sid. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you so much for your time. I will look forward to seeing you again. Yeah. Thanks to you and, and thanks to VWA for having me.